Hello everyone. Uh, today we have with us uh, Professor Sabina Leonelli, uh, who is a professor at uh, University of Exeter uh, and actually author of a lot of good books. One of which, one of my favorite bit of which is Big Data in Biology and a very recent book called uh, Philosophy of Open Science. Uh, so welcome Sabina. Uh, Thank you very yeah. much. Um, so yeah, I was just reading your book recently, the most recent book called uh, Philosophy of Open Science. It's a very fascinating book. I found it to be really uh, a good introduction to what Open Science Initiative is. So can you, like, for our viewers, tell a bit about what this Open Science Initiative actually is? Yeah, of course. Thank you. So the Open Science movement, yeah. as I call it in the book, is this um, attempt to try and counter a tendency that has been happening, especially over the last few decades mm. in the world of scientific research and especially academic research, to um, publish research in journals that are actually only available by subscription. So you have to pay a lot of money to be able to see mm. the results of academic research and especially publicly sponsored research. Mm. And also a tendency to privilege um, journal publications. So things that you actually publish in articles accessible through these particular journals over other products of scientific research like methods or data or um, simulations or code mm. or open source, right? Yeah. Things that are also very important as outputs of research. Mm -hmm. And in fact, arguably, are really important to check whether research is valuable and whether it's reliable and to check the quality of that research. Mm -hmm. But sometimes are not, in fact, made available to mm -hmm. the outside world. They sort of stay in the lab or, mm -hmm. or in the research group that produced them. Mm -hmm. And so the open science movement is an attempt to go back to, if you want, the origins of the idea of science itself, the fact that this is an enterprise which is by definition non-dogmatic, mm. by definition it builds on people confronting each other and scrutinizing each other and checking each other's work. Mm. And so openness is at the very heart of doing science because if you don't share your materials, if you're not um, aware of how people have developed their work and also what they've actually argued, mm. uh, then arguably you're not doing science at all. Right. So, so the open science movement is this idea of trying to make sure that scientific institutions, mm. uh, scientific publications, mm. uh, universities, and all of those different organizations really foster and support um, the, you know, the publication in an open and free environment of scientific results, and also support people's engagement with this. And that goes well beyond. Uh, academia and mm. the ivory tower. Mm. This really goes to try and involve different kinds of publics with different kinds of expertise in scientific discussions. So, for instance, um, one of the things that's really problematic now is because of the subscription journals mm. and the closure of um, uh, academic publications, people that may really need access to those journals who are not scientists, for instance, um, the relatives of um, people who have um, particular disease, mm -hmm. or lawyers who uh, need scientific evidence to defend their cases, uh, people like that don't necessarily have a good access uh, to the results of science. Mm -hmm. And so it's really the attempt to try and correct this mm -hmm. and make sure that um, everybody can participate in some way in, in the production of science, if possible, and at the very least in uh, understanding and making use of the products of science. Okay, that's great. But some people might say that, see, the, the journals, they maintain a kind of standard and basically they have to support themselves somehow. So with the peer review process and everything, if scientists are able to just, you know, uh, decimate the information where, where they want, uh, that kind of process will become more difficult to hold on to. I mean, think about something like the uh, MMR crisis that happened in the UK where uh, the scientists just went and publicized uh, the study without having like a proper peer, even before a proper peer review was done. Would that be a problem for something like that? Something of course, like, yeah. of course. So I think one of the misunderstandings, I think, yeah. with the open science movement, and especially the idea of open access, mm -hmm. is that it means anything goes, yeah. right? That we just give up on any gatekeeping, any mm. quality checks, and then anything that people who claim they're scientists yeah. publish gets published and becomes credible. Mm. And I think that's really a big misunderstanding. Okay, yeah. So the idea is to try and foster 
open publication where people can publish for free and, mm. and also can be read for free, mm. but without giving up on uh, processes by which the work is checked yeah. and uh, scrutinized and commented upon. Okay. So I think I mean, it's a very big problem, of course. Yeah. And one example where this became very recently a really big problem globally mm. is during the COVID pandemic. Mm. Uh, you know, you're aware of the fact that uh, many researchers to try and make results available quicker, mm. put those results uh, on so-called open access repositories. So before the work was scrutinized by peer reviews mm. and, um, and journals, uh, the work was published right away with the idea that, well, this is very urgent, we need these results fast, and so uh, they need to be made available. And on the one end, this was indeed very, very useful mm. because an awful lot of work was shared so quickly that actually that was one of the reasons why we got vaccines uh, yeah. during the pandemic so quickly. At the same time, it did create a lot of confusion because some of these results were later retracted mm. and some of the results were found to be problematic, right? Yeah. And so a lot of people also use that situation as a way to doubt science as a whole yeah. and say, but listen, I mean, this stuff is not confirmed, so why are we publishing it? Why should we rely on this? Yeah. Um, to the point that some of the repositories, like uh, Biomed Archive, which, yeah. which takes on some of these uh, preprints, got very nervous. And I remember mm. conversations with the editors of those repositories at the time, where they were kind of wondering what to do uh, about this, these issues. My position on this is that science is a fallible mm. enterprise, right? Yeah. And in fact, um, the better people realize this, um, the better we're going to be as a society. So science doesn't give you certainty, yeah. thank goodness, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's the point of science, that we can always improve, we can always find out maybe that some things were wrong and improve on them. Mm -hmm. So the very fact that you can always scrutinize science and sometimes maybe find that you can improve things or that in fact you change your mind is the strength of the scientific method and the scientific system. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, you also want to reach every now and then points where there is some consensus on something being yeah. a pretty reliable set of facts that mm. you can then act upon. And so the question continues to be, how do you balance these things out? So I think it's perfectly possible and it's done um, routinely mm. to have open access journals that actually maintain a lot of quality checks and, and in fact foster an even bigger debate among scientists because for instance instead of just asking two referees to have a look at a paper they ask many more people and they have a public discussion mm. so it's possible to really discuss the quality of um, a, a piece of scientific work but at the same time not to give up on the idea that this should be made available as widely as possible and also as fast as possible what it requires, which I think is, is a big societal change, mm. but I think is also really necessary at the moment, is for people to understand more and more that science is a process and that seeing it as a process of people who talk to each other and try and improve each other's work is really the best way to understand why we should rely on science, right? And so if you see, for instance, like at the beginning of the pandemic, mm. that people at the beginning said, oh, this is a very, very dangerous virus and um, it's, it's going to stick to all the surfaces. So we have to clean everything. We have to use all this disinfectant. And then little by little it became clear that this is mostly something that gets uh, kind of uh, distributed through air particles. And in fact, cleaning surfaces wasn't the most important thing, and the more important thing was wearing masks, right? I mean, some people saw that as evidence that science fails because, wow, well, look, they changed their mind and how is this possible? But in fact, I think it's quite the opposite. Um, it's just that, you know, you learn that science can learn fast. And the fact that we shifted towards, you know, wearing masks more often and letting go of other ideas is evidence of the fact that we can make progress. But shifting that mentality and thinking you know science is a process we can all get involved in it one way or the other of course most people don't have the time to do yeah. this on an everyday basis but if you get the sense that there's going to be changes and uh, hopefully they're going to go in the right direction mm. is a way both to get open science going but also a much much better way for everybody to understand better why science is a powerful tool right so so related to that there was uh, there's some Parts of your book which talk about citizen scientists and their involvement in the process of doing science, um, uh, which talks about how it's a process about people talking to each other. Uh, can you like tell me what exactly would be the role of a citizen scientist in this uh, movement of open science? How how are they engaged in it? What do they get out of it? Uh, 
what uh, how can they contribute to the scientific enterprise? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So, I suppose one classical way of thinking about citizen science is to say, well, we have to document lots of things in the world. Yeah. Um, there's lots of things we don't know, mm. and um, in in many cases, scientists need help. And so there's lots of initiatives around the world, including here in Bangalore, where uh, citizens are asked, you know, if you actually happen to have a walk on this river or to know a lot about this forest or to have a sense about what kind of pollution is happening in this particular country, can you help us to measure it? Can you take pictures? Can you take measurements? Can you help the scientists kind of bring in some documentation so we, we know a little bit more um, what is happening in all these different regions, right? And that's one very classical way to think about citizen scientists as people who contribute some of their time and their work to help in the actual scientists and the materials they need to do research. Yeah. And that's, you know, kind of the, the simplest version. I think a much more interesting version to think about citizen science is to recognize the fact that citizens or, you know, communities, people on the ground, um, have all sorts of things they know. There's lots of different kinds of expertise. People who are uh, very passionate about fishing will know a lot about the ecology of rivers and of the sea life that you can find in them. People who are passionate about doing hikes in the forest or passionate about bird watching will actually know a lot about the behaviors of the animals and uh, the types of plants that you find in different regions. Mm -hmm. And people who are passionate about clouds, for instance, they will do a lot of meteorological observations and they will know a lot about all of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, farmers would know a lot about the nature of the soil and the kind of uh, different cycles that one would uh, think about and what are the threats uh, to, to cultivation at the moment. And I think all too often we tend to underestimate these kinds of knowledges mm. as if they didn't have anything to do with science because these are not professional scientists, you know, they're not paid to do these kinds of work and so on and so forth. But I think it's been pretty well recognized um, certainly by some governments and um, some parts of academia that in fact these types of knowledges are really critical mm. to the scientific enterprise and to creating um, better science. Mm. And in fact, in many scientific domains, they've been part of the history of science for a long time. So oceanography, the science of the study of the ocean, mm. has for a long time relied on the accounts of seafarers yeah. and measurements taken by people who have to be on ships anyhow because they're on commercial ships for much of the year uh, to do the work that they do. And similarly, meteorology, is a science that for centuries has been based on the observation of lay people, mm. right? people who are not experts, but in fact know a lot about um, the, you know, the rhythm of the seasons and, like, and, and, and how the weather is changing in different places. Yeah. So it's just a question of, I think citizen science is in fact nothing new, mm. but it's a question of recognizing the fact that there's lots of sources of expertise that is of great relevance to scientific developments mm. across the population and empower people to actually participate in science by bringing in those experiences. So do you think the, the way philosophy of science has, I mean, they've done a kind of injustice by not recognizing these kind of ways of knowing traditionally, like as we all know like testimonial evidence is considered to be the kind of like a very low form of evidence. And uh, we are generally, the way philosophers of science think about how uh, evidence is collected is completely different from testimonial evidence. So I think that is something that is, um, do you think it's changing or is it something that needs to be challenged right now? I think that's part of your work uh, as well and you must have interacted with people, other philosophers of science who would have had views about it. Like what do you think is happening? In this world? For sure, <laughs> you're right. So yeah, I think philosophy of science as a field as a really important role to play in many of these discussions because, you know, I have the luxury, as do you, as yeah. philosophers of science, of sort of sitting a bit in the back mm. of some of these big um, scientific projects yeah. and actually have a look from a, with a bit of distance and a kind of being able to contextualize this mm. work in a much broader sense because we have the time to do this and the skills yeah. to be able to contextualize this historically but also socially mm. and think about 
not just the content of the science that we are uh, producing, but also the social environment in which is produced, the institutions which are involved, and, and what all of this means for the type of science we end up uh, then making. Yeah. So I think it's a great privilege to mm. be in that position, and it means that we can be in the middle of lots of discussions, for instance, between policymakers and scientists, or yeah. we can, between different parts of society and scientists, because we are in this kind of mediating role where mm. we can see things more broadly. Um, so in that sense, um, it is true that some philosophers of science have very, very strong views about the fact that only certain kinds of evidence should be considered to be reliable, yeah. and particularly things that are produced under laboratory conditions, under very strict control conditions, yeah. or things that are produced through so-called randomized controlled trials, yeah. where, again, the conditions under which you produce knowledge are very tightly monitored. Mm. And there is this, at least in some circles, but it, I mean, actually more than philosophers, this tends to be in certain scientific circles like yeah. evidence-based medicine, yeah. where the assumption is, well, the tighter the conditions are under which you carry out a certain experiment, the better and more reliable your results will be. Yeah. One of the things that philosophers of science have also shown, and certainly is also part of my work, is that um, under other conditions, you can in fact produce uh, results that are also very reliable. Mm. For one thing, and when you are uh, producing scientific results under very, very tight control conditions, very often those um, research environments become very artificial. Mm. Right? They become more and more detached to what things would look like yeah. when they happen in a natural population, a natural real ecosystem. This goes for live work on model organisms on animal models, where you end up working on a very, 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 um, uh, you know, isolated set of organisms which are not in their own original environment, which have been modified, sometimes genetically modified, to be tractable in the lab. And you obtain very precise results. But then there are big, these big questions. Of, so what does these results mean hmm. when you bring them back into right. the world as it yeah. is, right? So if you know, I do an experiment on this mouse and it tells me that if I use this drug, uh, the mouse gets cured of a certain kind of cancer. Is this representative of what's going to happen to me if I have the same kind of cancer and I start assuming that drug in the complex world I live in, right? Similarly, um, for you know, randomized controlled trials in medicine, mm. uh, these are carried out in a very particular group of people under very particular conditions. And there's always going to be this question around, okay, so you know, usually these are experiments made on males rather than females. They're not done on children, they're not done on older people. They're usually done on people who are in relatively good health mm. uh, because you want to make sure that they're, you know, they can withstand a drug that may be a bit heavy. But, you know, so you take them now out in, you know, the outside world where we will take medicines whenever we think we need to. What does that mean? Is that result representative, right? So even with very controlled experiments, there are serious questions around what do these results mean for us? At the same time, there are situations where, you know, a farmer may be, you know, experimenting with planting different crops in different types of soil and use different kinds of fertilizer and pesticides in their own field. This may not be done systematically in the same way that a scientist would do, but it doesn't mean that some of the insights that people take out of these kinds of experiments wouldn't be valuable, especially if you're able to reconstruct um, you know, the story of how they were made, you know, how they were actually carried out. Hmm. So I think um, what a philosopher of science can also do is to be much more of what we call a pluralist, so much more um, open-minded about the fact that we're going to have different kinds of evidence, mm. different kinds of data and outcomes that go on in science and through different methods. And each of them can have a different value. Mm. And they're going to be very effective in some contexts and maybe less effective in others. And so what we really want to make science better is to have as many types of evidence as possible, rather than just saying, oh, this is the way to do things and that's going to be the only way uh, we produce knowledge. It, it doesn't tend to work very well. Usually what works much better is to try and think about a problem from lots and lots of different perspectives and then bring people in, bring different kinds of expertise and methods in and then see what happens. And I think that's the kind of thing that citizen science can also encourage. Mm. And hopefully uh, philosophers can play a role in also encouraging this and also demonstrating how useful it can be. Hmm, that's, that's interesting. I mean, I also like, I've, I've heard you say that you're like philosopher of biology first. Right? Um, so very specifically, when, when you interact with biologists, um, have you ever felt that there are places where philosophers can 
contribute to biology, biology specifically, where you think, yes, they are doing something, but I think they have not thought about this aspect of it, which I, I as a philosopher can really help out um, them see or them explore further. Of course, I think that's absolutely, in fact, happening all the time in our field. Yeah. And I prefer to think about it as a collaborative enterprise. So it's not that, you know, yeah. as a philosopher, I can, mm -hmm. you know, tell people what to do. That's absolutely not the point. But the question is, there are different skills being, being put together. And that's always useful to try and see things from, from different perspectives. So very often what philosophers can offer to a biologist is a certain kind of conceptual analysis, mm -hmm. often also informed by understanding of history. And this we've seen very often in genetics, so understanding how do we understand genes, the fact that different biologists, different specialties may actually uh, think about genes differently, and this makes a difference to the research, but it's not always well recognized. And um, attempting to conceptualize, um, you know, the dynamic nature of biological processes, um, cautioning biologists about the fact that, you know, we're talking about very complex, uh, very holistic processes that we then try and um, divide up in bits so we can study them, but it's always been mindful of the fact that we've done that. Yeah. And, and so, we, you know, philosophy we say we've refined some parts of those processes. So what happens when you put them back together mm. is also something useful. Uh, there's been philosophical work that has contributed to methodology itself. So how does one use statistics, for instance, or certain forms of statistics in the analysis of biological data? Mm. Uh, how does one conceptualize uh, causality? And particularly in terms of, you know, what kind of uh, biological pathways may be associated to certain effects or certain traits. And thinking about classification has been also something that philosophers can really help with. Mm -hmm. Why do we use different taxonomies for different phenomena? And what is what are different taxonomies useful for? Mm -hmm. How does one set up experiments? And why making, for instance, a choice of certain organisms rather than another? That's also something that a philosopher uh, who is, you know, an expert on those kinds of issues can help with. And of course, there's all these questions around how do we think about biological world within a social world, mm -hmm. which is completely interactive with it all the time. Yeah. I mean, we do know that what we do in society changes our biology profoundly, right? Like the way in which we're exposed to the environment, exposed to pollutants, what we eat, uh, the way we behave. I mean, all of this is what we sometimes call nurture, right? But we yeah. know very well that nurture is a big part of our nature, is, yeah. is how we choose to become and, and, and what we end up shaping our organisms as. Mm -hmm. And so recognizing these intersections, I think, is also something that philosophers can help to do, mm -hmm. partly because, you know, we tend to be interdisciplinary beings. Yeah. So, so it's our job to make different parts of science communicate with each other. Yeah, that's great. So, I mean, I think you've answered parts of what I'm going to ask you next, but like, how can philosophers and I don't want to specifically ask about philosophers of science because uh, more or less we have heard, but philosophers in general uh, contribute to society, to policy, to, to just the way things are. Beyond just science, but in general philosophers, how can we help out? Uh, generally we are seen as, as, you know, isolated, like thinking in abstract terms, not interacting much with uh, how the world is. Uh, we are many a times doing a lot of a priori, uh, thinking about uh, conceptual things rather than that's how we are perceived but how can we actually contribute to the, to the world? Yeah well I think um, the current problems we're experiencing in the world that goes from you know big economic crisis in many different places, huge inequity uh, socially speaking and of course the global climate crisis and environmental mm -hmm. crisis we're experiencing. I think all of those challenges require critical reflection right? mm -hmm. and I think it's about that be clear that just acting on those things without thinking about the potential consequences of the interventions that we decide to make mm -hmm. can in fact have disastrous effects and can make things even worse. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think the discipline of philosophy, really in terms of being disciplined towards thinking critically about uh, not just a particular issue, but the implications of that issue, how that issue fits in a wider set of concerns, 
are more important than ever. Mm. Um, I mean, what can pontificate about this a matter much you want, but yeah. it's really been my practical personal experience also that is, it can be useful. So in my work, I never expected, um, I've been focused on questions around how people use organisms in the lab, for instance, or how one um, uses data to uh, create knowledge. I never would have thought that I would have uh, ended up participating in a lot of policy discussions. But it ended up being the case because, mm. as it turns out, when governments these days are trying to decide what does it mean to open up uh, information to the public, what does it mean to govern in a way that it's uh, democratic and fair, how does one use the information that comes from science and technology to create a better society and to get humans to flourish, as yeah. most governments are committed to do. And then, you know, there are there is a need for certain terminology, and there is a need for uh, framing the discussion and the policy intervention in a particular way. And lo and behold, um, philosophers become very relevant in these kinds of discussions. So, for instance, when it comes to open science, this is something which a lot of governments are very interested in because it's closely related to questions around democracy and democratic um, representation and um, democratic governance. And so I ended up being called into lots of policy meetings where people had genuine questions around, you know, how do we conceptualize openness? And what are the implications of thinking about this in one way or the other? Who are we excluding and including when we're adopting certain kinds of discourse? So I think that's just a demonstration of the fact that philosophical reflection can in fact be helpful because um, to frame, to find the language, the right uh, words and the right discussion and discourse uh, to frame these problems is actually really hard. Yeah. And so to have people who are trained to spend their time doing this and have the tools to try and help others um, to bring together our thinking and think about this um, as a way of challenge is a useful thing. Thank you, Sabina. It was really lovely talking to you. Uh, if you want to check out more work by Sabina, I would really recommend uh, this uh, book called uh, Philosophy of Open Science. It's a really nice book, very accessible. So I really encourage you to go and check it out. Thank you. Thank you very much.